Have you ever wondered what happens when a check bounces? Well, let's demystify this for you. Check bouncing, in layman's terms, is a situation where a check that you've issued or received cannot be processed due to insufficient funds in the account. Sounds simple, right? But the implications can be far-reaching. Under the Negotiable Instruments Act, or the NI Act, check bouncing can lead to legal proceedings. One crucial section of this Act is Section 138, which specifically deals with dishonor of checks. It's like a roadmap guiding us through the legal labyrinth that unfolds when a check bounces. From issuing a legal notice to the drawer to court proceedings, and finally the judgment, Section 138 outlines it all. But that's not all, there's also an alternative solution available under the Civil Procedure Code. Intriguing, isn't it? Now, let's delve into what exactly happens when a check bounces under Section 138 of the NI Act. The first step when a check bounces is the issuance of a legal notice. This isn't just any casual letter, but a formal communication that serves as a preliminary caution to the drawer, the person who wrote the check, about the dishonor of their check. Now this notice isn't simply left to the whims of the wind, it must be issued within 15 days from the day the check was dishonored. So, what does this notice contain? It should lay out all the relevant facts of the case including the amount for which the check was issued, the date on which it was presented to the bank, and the reason for its dishonor. It's like a mini-story providing a clear picture of the situation at hand. This notice is then sent to the drawer via registered post. This ensures proof of delivery, an important element in legal proceedings. Once the legal notice is sent, the drawer has 15 days to make the payment. The ball is now in the drawer's court. Following the issuance of the legal notice, a critical phase takes place. The drawer is provided a grace period of 15 days to settle the matter by making the payment. This period is like a ticking clock. Each second passing by is an opportunity for the drawer to rectify the situation. If the drawer chooses to make the payment within this time frame, then the matter is resolved. The issue is settled and the clouds of legal proceedings disperse. It's as if the drawer gets a second chance to correct the unfortunate circumstance of a bounced check. It's a simple solution, isn't it? Make the payment and avoid the legal hassle. It's a win-win situation for both parties involved. However, life isn't always that straightforward. But what happens if the drawer fails to make the payment within these 15 days? The plot thickens and the story takes a different turn. If the drawer fails to make the payment, a complaint is filed under Section 138 of the NI Act. This is where things start to get serious. The complainant, or the person who was supposed to receive the payment, takes the matter to court. But what does this process look like? Well, first off, the complaint is filed before a magistrate. This is a legal official who has the power to administer and enforce the law. The complaint contains all the relevant facts, detailing how the drawer, or the person who wrote the check, has not fulfilled their obligation. This could be because they didn't make the payment within the stipulated 15 days, or because they outright refused. The court then takes over and conducts the proceedings. It's a structured process where both parties, the complainant and the accused, present their arguments. The complainant might detail how the non-payment has caused them financial harm or how the drawer's actions were unethical. On the other hand, the accused, that's the drawer, also has the right to defend themselves. They might argue that the complaint is baseless or that there's a misunderstanding. Or perhaps they could claim that they were unable to make the payment due to unforeseen circumstances. It's a fair process and both sides are given the opportunity to present their case. The court proceedings require patience and perseverance. It's not a fast process as the court has to ensure that justice is served correctly. After all, it's not just about a bounce check, it's about upholding the law and ensuring that people fulfill their obligations. After hearing both sides and reviewing the evidence, the court then comes to a decision. This decision, or judgment, is based on the facts the law and the arguments presented by both parties. It's not a matter of who shouts the loudest, but who presents the most compelling and legally sound argument. The court then passes a judgment based on the evidence and arguments presented. This judgment can bring relief to the complainant, or it might uphold the accused's defense. 
but either way, it's a decision that is taken with the utmost care and consideration for the law. After the court proceedings, the court passes a judgment. This is the moment when all the facts, arguments and evidence presented during the trial come together to form a final decision. The court's judgment in this case is based on the evidence and arguments from both sides. It's a meticulous process where every detail matters. The court examines the circumstances of the check dishonor, the intent of the draw and the responses to the legal notice and complaint. If it is found that the dishonor of check was done with malicious intent or without reasonable cause, the court can rule in the complainant's favor. The implications of this judgment are significant. If the drawer is found guilty, they can be penalized with imprisonment which may extend to two years or with a fine which may extend to twice the amount of the check or with both. This verdict serves as a deterrent, ensuring the sanctity of checks as a trusted mode of payment. However, it's important to note that the legal journey under Section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act may be long and arduous. This brings us to an alternative solution, filing a summary suit under Order 37 of the Civil Procedure Code, or CPC. A summary suit is a faster method of obtaining a decree for the recovery of the check amount. In this process, the defendant is given a limited time to defend themselves, making it a quicker route to justice. However, it has its own set of prerequisites. The relief claimed in the suit should be strictly in accordance with the check amount. This means if the check was for a specific amount, the claim in the suit cannot exceed that amount. So whether you choose to proceed under Section 138 of the NI Act or opt for a summary suit under Order 37 of the CPC, each route has its own advantages and challenges. It's crucial to understand these processes and make an informed decision based on your specific circumstances. Understanding the proceedings under Section 138 of the NI Act can help you handle situations of check bouncing effectively. Remember, knowledge is power, and in this case, it can be your strongest ally. So, let's quickly recap what we've discussed today. We've delved into the intriguing world of Section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act or NI Act, which deals with the dishonoring of checks. The steps involved in the proceedings start with the issuance of a legal notice to the draw, followed by a 15-day window for the draw to make the payment. If payment is not made within this period, a complaint under Section 138 of the NI Act is filed before a magistrate. The court then conducts proceedings where both parties present their arguments. And finally, a judgment is passed based on the evidence and arguments presented. We also discussed an alternative solution to check dishonor, filing a summary suit under Order 37 of the Civil Procedure Code, or CPC. This provides a faster method of obtaining a decree, although the relief claimed should align strictly with the check amount. Remember, knowledge is power and understanding your rights and responsibilities can go a long way in navigating the financial world.